Hey, I want you to turn uh, to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. And I want us to talk about change. There's something about change that frustrates every one of us, and that is you don't get to stay in the same place in the same pattern of your life. So would you bow with me for a moment and ask, uh, ask God to give you a sense of a new direction for your life. What does he want from you today? God, I just want to ask that as you reveal yourself, you, you want to take us places we've never been. And so, God, would you just go ahead and get us out of that stubbornness and out of that rut that we tend to stay in? And God, we just want to declare to you as your people, we're ready to go with you. Wherever you go, whatever you ask, God, we're going. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, change for me is so difficult because everything's moving. How many of you get seasick? How many of you get seasick when you go out? A lot of you? You know, I've, I've, I've really not ever had a big issue with it. Uh, we went out fishing. We went out on a, a charter, and the guy told us a lot of charters weren't going out that day because the waves were like four to six. And we're thinking, oh, man, let's go, you know. Had all the family, all the kids. We get out there, standing in the back of that boat, and we were catching fish. There wasn't a problem with the fish, but that thing was rocking with those waves. Rachel said, I'm not feeling well. I'm going to go lay down. So I've got a rod in my hand, man, and I'm catching, everybody was catching fish. And in a minute, all of a sudden, it's like, ooh, I don't feel real good. And so I just simply, one of the kids said, hey, I'll take your rod, Dad. Let me have it. I'll catch your fish. You go on and lay down. <clears throat> I said, no, I'm going to stay out here. And the captain said something to me that I thought was very interesting. <clears throat> he said, David, if you'll, if you'll look at something that's not moving, it'll be okay. You'll feel better. I'm thinking, what is not moving? I mean, everything is just, <laughs> this thing is going up and down, and I'm moving, they're moving, everything's moving. He said, look at the horizon. It's not moving. So I'm, <laughs> I'm looking, I'm staring, man. You know, one of the kids catches, hey, Dad, look. Uh-uh, I'm, lo uh -uh, I'm looking at the horizon, man. <laughs> and you know what? It actually helped. And then you, when you get back, you know, close to land and you start seeing the, the beach and you start, you're fine. What is the deal with that? When you can find something that's not moving, you feel settled. It does something to you physically. I think spiritually, when you can find things that don't move in your life, you just do a lot better. The book of Deuteronomy is Moses standing on the bank of the Jordan River before they go into a new land, basically preaching three sermons telling them what doesn't move. He's just telling them, here's what you hang on to. Here's what will never fail you. I don't care what happens in that land. If you remember these things, they never move. And so what is it that we, as you look at Deuteronomy, as we think together, what, what do we know about this book? Okay, it's, a, it's sermons of Moses, three of them, <clears throat> three of them. It's also Jesus' favorite book in the Old Testament. Many, many argue that. I think they got a good case. Here's why. He quoted from it more often than any other. And when he was tempted... In Matthew 4, every time for three temptations, he responded with Scripture. Where was that Scripture from? Deuteronomy. So in the, in the heart and the mind of our Lord, it was the way he fought the enemy. And out of 27 books in the New Testament, only six books don't have a reference to Deuteronomy. The name is not Hebrew at all. The name Deuteronomy is not Hebrew. It's Greek. It comes from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The word deutero means two. The word namas is law. You put them together, the second law. Now, this book is not the second law. It's really just him going over the first law, making sure they got it. But that's how it got the name Deuteronomy. It's the last of the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, 
And it's a book, quite honestly, people don't realize the depth. They don't realize what's in here. You're going to see things in here that are absolutely amazing. And as we walk through it together, there's going to be this challenge for every one of us as we go through change. Let's find things that don't move. Okay? So with that being said, I want to show you a picture of where this book was first proclaimed. Where did Moses preach those sermons? Because this book is about a journey, all right? Let's look at this map. Now, this is an oversimplification. It's a, it's a place, a, a daily study Bible at uh, keyway.com. And I don't know much about the, the website. I just know that map was simple and it was easy to read from a distance. So that's why we're using that map. Notice they leave Egypt. Okay, you see it up there. They leave Egypt on the left of the, of the map. And then they come down to the peninsula, the Sinai Peninsula, and they come down to Mount Sinai. That's where they got the law. That's where God gave the Ten Commandments. That's Exodus, okay? Then they go north, all right? Once they get on the north side of Lake Apopka, right there, you notice, they turn and go even further north. They go up to a little place up there called Kadesh. That's Kadesh Barnea, okay? It's the wilderness of Zen, right up there. Not Zen Buddhist, that's a whole other Zen. That is a wilderness that was a really bad wilderness, okay? That was where God said, send spies into the land. So go to the top of that loop. They're camped there, and he said, go check out the land that I'm going to give you. And all they had to do was go north, and they could spy out the land. So 12 spies, one from each tribe, went into the land. They went north. And they came back. Ten of them agreed. And you just show me, did they give it a thumbs up or thumbs down? They said, no way. That land has giants. That land has walled cities. There's no way we can. We, we're like grasshoppers compared to those people. But two, Joshua and Caleb said, we can take that land. And the people would not listen to Joshua. They would not listen to Caleb. So look at the loop-de-loop. -loop. Why is that loop there? That wasn't God's plan. That was their rebellion. They rebelled against God. They didn't want to go into the land. They didn't want to take the land. So guess what they do? They make a big loop. And they go right back down to where they had already been. How many of you have a loop in your life? How many of you have a map that you just didn't get it? You just didn't want to go through the change. You didn't. I mean, I kind of felt like that announcing today that now I have a Facebook page now that everybody's left Facebook and we're on to Instagram and everything else. So it's almost like we don't want to do something and then we finally we do it and we miss so much. Listen to this. He let a whole generation be swallowed up. God did. Because they rebelled. The rebellion of Korah. I mean, they were, they were terrible. They murmured. They complained against God. They said God hated them. And that God brought them out in that wilderness to die. And God's going, no, I didn't. This wilderness is on the way to this incredible land called the promised land, the land of milk and honey. you got to trust me. I'll fight for you. I'll go before you. Did everything that he could do, God did. And they said no, so they have a loop. And I just wonder how many of us want to keep going around that loop in our life. Because God's taken you on a journey and you just don't want to go. You don't want to take that step of obedience. So what do you do? You go around the mountain again and again and again. And then finally, another generation grew up and he said, let's go. Go back to the map if we can. And so then they go up and they're all the way up at the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is right there at the top where the red line ends. They come to Jericho. They're right across the river from Jericho. They can see the promised land. And the people are camped on the banks of the Jordan on the east side. And the promised land is on the west side. And Moses said, now before you go in, let me get you ready. You're going to have a great land. It's beautiful in there. Moses knew. God had showed him. He went up on Mount Pisgah, the Bible says. And he looked and he saw it all. He knew. He heard the spies when they came back. He believed the spies when they came back. And so he says to them, you're going you're gonna to be blessed. You're going to have an incredible time. But please remember, there's some things that never change. The word remember is used 15 times in the book of Deuteronomy. Because he didn't want them to forget where they've been. And then he says about 15 times, be careful. 
meaning you got to watch and follow him. And then 27 times the idea of the covenant is in this book. So with that kind of backdrop, if you, with your Bible open, chapters 1, 2, and 3 are basically rehearsing the journey that led them up to Jericho. Everything I just said about that map is in chapter 1, 2, and 3. Moses is standing there with him, and he's saying, hey, I want to remind you where you came from. I want to remind you how you got here. I think that's a pretty cool deal. And I think that as we move on as a church and we, we think about moving ahead, you got to look back. Why do you have to look back? Because you want to make sure you never forget where you came from. God's been good to us. God's blessed us. Think about your life. Think about your journey. Has God been good to you? Has he blessed you? I get a witness in the room. Has God been good to you? Has he blessed you? I mean, we, we, gotta, we can't forget. It's not what have you done for me lately. Look at what God has done on the journey. And so the first three chapters really is about that. Then he gets to chapter 4. And by the way, those giants, he tells him in chapter 3, the king Og is dead. He's the last of the giants. I just think this is so cool. Chapter 3 is basically God telling the people, hey, by the way, the guys you worried about in there, those big guys, those really big guys, guess what? They're all gone. The last one's dead. His name is Og. And by the way, you know how big he was? There's a verse in there. This is so cool. The Bible gives you stories and things that you would never think. It gives us the size of his bed. How many of you have a king-size bed? Okay. How many of you have a California king? That's a little bigger, isn't it? Isn't it? I mean, I'm, I heard it's a little longer or whatever. Let me tell you how big this one was. It wasn't king size. It was 13 and a half feet long, six and a half feet wide. Finally, a bed my feet will not hang off of. That would be an awesome bed. 13 and a half feet long. That's where, the, that's where Og slept, but now he's gone. Why? Because God took care of him. He promised his people he would. They just wouldn't listen. So now, chapter 4, we're ready. They're at, the land, they're at the river. They're looking over into Jordan. They're ready to go. So now, chapter 4, he gives them three big rocks that will never move. And I want you to write them down on that little blank piece of paper that you have, the listening guide. Write the first one. Obey God. Follow him. All right, just write those phrases. Obey God, follow him. The second big rock, God is Lord. God alone is Lord. If you want to add the word alone, God is the Lord. And the third one, there is nobody like him. Worship him. And those are all in this chapter. And I want you to look at the first one, which is obey God, follow him, starting in verse 1, chapter 4. And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I'm teaching you. Do them so that you're going to live. And you're going to go in and you're going to take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. Don't add to the word that I command you or take from it. That if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you, your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor, for the Lord your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are all alive today. That is such a cool statement. He said, those of you who held fast. Now, if you write in your Bible, underline the word held fast. Held fast. Fast. Those of you who held fast to God, you're still alive. The word held fast in Hebrew is a word that you probably heard it this way. And I'll quote the scripture from G Genesis 2, 24. If you've been to a wedding lately, you might have heard that word. It goes like this. And for this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. The word cleave in Hebrew is hold fast. And he says to them in the same picture of marriage, he says, those of you who held on to God, 
Just like a covenant marriage, when you hold on to each other, when a husband and wife, when they depend on each other, they lean into each other going through trials. Those of you who have held on to God, guess what? You're still alive. And I just think that's why we're here today. I think God has blessed those who have held on to him. And so Moses says, you follow him because he will get you through. Verse 5, see, I have taught you the statutes and the rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you're going to take. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding and sight of all the people, who when they hear all the statutes, they'll say, surely this great nation is wise and understanding, an understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near as the Lord our God is near to us whenever we call upon him. And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I have set before you this day? That is an amazing thought. Moses says, there's not another nation out there like you. There's not another people that have a God so close and have rules that are so righteous and that make sense. There's not anybody else like you Follow God. Obey what he has written. And then he says, and by the way, pass it on. Because you got children that are coming behind you. Verse 9, only take care. Keep your soul, keep, uh, soul diligently lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and to your children's children. So basically, he just says in this opening part of the chapter, obey God. He's near you. Nobody has this. All the nations on earth, you are a great people. And when people see your obedience, it's going to touch them. It's going to bless them. And when they see you calling on God, they're going to wonder, how do you have such a close relationship with God? That's the picture. That's what the church is. I mean, that's what every one of us enjoy. We are obedient among people who maybe are not, but that obedience is a witness to them. That when you obey God, it matters. He blesses. Now, the second big rock, what was it? God is Lord. He alone is Lord. Look at verse 15. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at, Mount, at, the Hor at Horeb out of the midst of fire. Beware lest you act corruptly, by making a carved image for yourself in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven. And when you see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the host of heaven, you'll be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them Things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples on the whole earth. Now, what is his point? His point is this. There is only one who is Lord and sovereign over all. It is God. Don't make an idol for him. You have him. Don't let something else keep you from going directly to him. That's, all of this is back in the Old Testament uh, giving of the law. Whenever the Ten Commandments were given, you're not to make a, a graven image. Why was it so important to God that they not make a likeness of him? The same reason it's important to me that you don't follow a fake Facebook page when you have the real me. How would you be offended if your husband never kissed you, never spoke to you, but spoke to a picture of you on his dresser? And you're on the other side of the bed going, hey, I'm over here. You don't have to look at a picture. I'm here. It's exactly the way God thinks. He's saying to you, I am your God. You don't need to make an image of me because you can't capture me in an image. You can't capture me in something that you make. I'm bigger than that. And by the way, you have me. I'm with you. And when you get in there and you look up at the moon and you look up at the sun and you look at the stars, there are going to be people around you that worship them and they bow down and they look for their future in them. Don't dare do it because you have me for your future. Instead of looking at the stars and worshiping them, worship the one who made the stars. Does that make sense? Isn't that awesome? God is getting them ready for every little thing. 
And let's just be honest. We live in a world that worships the stars and the sun and the moon and make sure, you know, that you know what your sign is. Hey, let me tell you something. If you, if you just want to waste some time, if you want to just, just waste time, read your horoscope. Have at it. Knock yourself out. Because you know what the truth is? The stars will tell you nothing about your life. You need to talk to the one who made the stars. He'll tell you everything you need to know about your life. Now, that's just what he's saying to them. Don't worship the sun and the moon. You worship me. Why? Because I love you. And he moves into some of the most tender verses. Here's the one that I like. Verse 20. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace of Egypt to be a people of his own inheritance as you are to this day. In other words, the very same furnace people make idols out of, hey, I brought you out of a furnace, except it was called Egypt. And it was a really bad place. But the reason I brought you out is because you're my inheritance. And I am your inheritance. In other words, you have me. I'm your inheritance. You've got everything I am. I mean, you realize that this morning? We have everything that God is. Then Moses does something that is very sad to me. He tells them, I'm not going to be able to go into that land with you because I made a mistake. Now, I don't mind telling you that. This is what I struggle with. Read it with me. Furthermore, verse 21, the Lord was angry with me because of you, and he swore that I should not cross Jordan and that I should not enter the good land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. For I must die in this land. I must not go over the Jordan, but you shall go over and take possession of that good land. Take care lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and don't make a carved image the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. You see, I think Moses in that moment just looked at them and said, hey, if you don't think what I'm telling you matters, let me tell you my story. I'm not going because I did not follow him and I did not do what he said. Now, to make it real simple, basically Moses disobeyed God when they were in the wilderness. God told him not to strike the rock, and he struck the rock. He struck the rock to get water. And in that disobedience, God said to him, you're not going to go in the promised land. I, I'm, when I get to heaven, I'm going to find Moses and say, man, how did that feel? This is hard. You mean Moses failed, and so... He doesn't get to go into that promised land. That's right. Why? I don't know. Maybe it's God trying to teach us the consequences when we don't obey. And you know what? Here's an interesting take on this. Moses is telling these people, getting them ready. God's asked him to get them ready to go in, and he's telling the people to obey when he himself didn't obey. So how many times have you looked at somebody and said, well, I can't listen to you. You've messed up. You know what? We might want to back off on that because God has a lot to teach us through people who have messed up. In fact, God is really good at using broken vessels. You know why he's good at it? Because that's all he's got. There's not a perfect one among us. Every Sunday you listen to a broken vessel. And for those of you who have made a mistake in here and messed up, no, you're not out. Look at Moses. I mean, Moses is playing a part of getting the people ready even though he can't go because of a mistake. There are consequences to disobeying. But Moses said, I can get you ready, and I can tell you it's painful. In fact, I think he said it with just this pain in his heart that he didn't get to go into the land. But you're going, he said. And he said, I want you to remember, don't you dare go against God because he is a consuming fire and a jealous God. Now, what is verse 24 about? I think it's actually one of the greatest verses in this whole chapter. A jealous God is not a bad thing. In fact, let me show you how great it is to have a jealous God. If I walked up to one of you men and said to you, you know, your wife is really awesome. Would, would you mind sharing her with some guys in the church? You're going to look at me and absolutely say, in no way. I mean, you'll let me know. Not a way in the world, right? Why? Because they love her. 
If you came and said, hey, could you share Rachel? No way. Why? I love her. Am I being jealous? Yeah, I'm being jealous. But you know what? That's a good thing. Because I love her, I'm jealous. Because I want her for myself, I'm jealous. That's the way God is with you. He don't want to share you with the other gods and the other things in this world. He wants you for himself. And consuming fire doesn't mean he burns you up in judgment. You don't become a crispy critter. He just says, my love will touch every part of your being. It is a consuming fire. You can't stop the love of God. It will consume you. And so he's saying, he alone is God. you got to follow him because he loves you and he has made a covenant with you. And by the way, in case you do act corruptly, verse 25, when, you're, when you father children and children's children and you grow old in the land, if you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything and by doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God as to provoke him to anger. Now watch this. Go down to verse 31. The Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. Here is this incredible picture of grace. Hey, if you lose your way as you go through this new land, as you go through change, if you get a little off course, remember this, God's merciful. He is merciful. He will not give up on you. And those verses remind us what it's like when we've messed up. And there's some people in this room today that have messed up, you've lost your way, and you're thinking, you know, I've been on that loop, I've been making that loop over and over. God surely could not ever bring straightness out of my life and bring me to that promised land. Yes, he can. Why? Because he's a merciful God. And he wanted to remind them, God is merciful. So the last big rock is this. There's nobody like God. Worship him you gotta see, you got to see these verses. you got to read them with me. Verse 32. For ask now of the days that are past which were before you. Since the day that God created man on earth, ask from one end of heaven to the other whether such a great thing as this has ever happened or ever was heard of. And you're thinking, what great thing? What God is doing for his people. Watch what he says. Did any people ever hear a voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have and still live? Or has any God ever attempted to go and take a nation for himself from midst other nations by trials, signs, wonders, and by war, by mighty hand and an outstretched arm, by great deeds of terror, all of which the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? In other words, have you ever heard another story of a God rescuing a people from Egypt? No, but he did you. Verse 35, to you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides him. Out of heaven he let you hear his voice, that he might discipline you. And on earth he let you see his great fire. And you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved your fathers and he chose their offspring after them and he brought you out of Egypt with his presence, his own presence, and by his great power, driving out before you nations that were greater and mightier than you to bring you in, to give you their land for an inheritance as it is to this day. Know, therefore, today and lay it to your heart that the Lord is God in heaven and on earth beneath and there is no other. Is that not awesome? Give the Lord praise. That. There's not another God like him. There's not another story. Think about what he's done for you. Think about the gospel. Is there another story on the planet of a God who in heaven sends his son to take the sin of humanity so that now we receive by grace a gift of forgiveness and eternal life? Is there another people on the planet that have the story that God's people have? No. Has anybody ever loved you the way God loves you? No. Has anybody ever done for you what God has done for you? No. The answer is no. And Moses is looking at them standing there at the river, and he's going, guys, there's nobody like him. Follow him. He's given you a land. This is a story nobody's ever told before. He's doing something among you. Follow him and worship him. 
And the last verse is kind of the summary. Verse 40. Therefore you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, that you may prolong your days in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for all time. In other words, no matter what changes in your life, there is one thing that will never change. There's nobody like our God. And our God is faithful. And he is merciful. And he loves you.